My name is uh, Steve Rothbeck, and I have the opportunity to introduce Lauren Ornelas. Uh, Lauren is the founder and executive director of the Food Empowerment Project. Her uh, topic today is food justice. She's been involved in animal rights for over 20 years. She's invest investigated slaughterhouses and factory farms. She's been able to influence uh, uh, corporate corporations, including her ability to convince Pier 1 imports to stop using feathers, um, her ability to uh, convince Trader Joe's to stop selling uh, duck meat. She was the spark that um, caused John Mackey, a co-founder of uh, Whole Foods, to become vegan. Uh, she's the former executive director uh, Viva USA, a national nonprofit vegan advocacy organization, and she spent several d years with In Defense of Animals. She is an accomplished speaker and has given TED Talks. So, Lauren? And I will need a timer, because supposedly I'm supposed to go lightning fast, and I'm not prepared to. So um, my name is Lorna Nellis, and I'm really thankful to be here today. And was mentioned, I've been an animal rights activist since 1987. And during this time, I have undergone what some people have called, I was really everybody's best friend when I was got the one, John Mackey, um, the co-founder of Whole Foods Market, to go vegan. But as I started talking about human rights issues, and as I talk, talked about being a proud Chicana, which means that I am Mexican and a proud Mexican, um, family, um, first generation on my dad's side, and my family on my mom's side was in Mexico before it was even Texas. So once I started talking about those issues, all of a sudden the speaking requests stopped, and I started becoming more marginalized in the animal rights community. And I want to thank Breeze, even though I know she's not in the room, ding her. Um, because she has actually helped me realize what I've had to endure in the animal rights movement, um, being a form of white fragility, to where when I spoke at Boston University about the plight of farm workers working in the fields in California, I was shouted down by a vegan activist during my presentation telling me I didn't know what I was talking about. Farm workers liked their work, only to find out later that she volunteered at an animal sanctuary and those were the farm workers she was speaking of. So being involved in this movement um, for so long has meant that I have fewer chairs to speak to. And so I apologize that I am going to go through what I'm intended to speak about later to the most of my possible lightning fast 15, 20 minutes right now. Because I think the animal rights movement needs to hear it. I often get concerned about speaking at any type of animal rights conference which talks about intersectionality because unfortunately many people in the animal rights movement think that intersectionality are brown and black people talking about veganism. That's not what it is. It's just the fact that many of us who are people of color have come face to face and understand what social and economic injustice is like. We see it up front on a daily basis and our families go through it on a regular basis. To many people, this is news, but to us, this is life. A lot of times at these conferences, and I know it's going to be happening here because I saw the agenda, but there's also that, how do we get more people of color involved in the animal rights movement, which offends me to no end. People of color are activists in their own communities. There are things we are fighting in our communities from contaminated water, which happened way before everybody heard about Flint, as well as toxic dumps, oil refineries, and truck depots contaminating our airways and our water pollution and our water. We are activists in our own right. If the animal rights movement wants to understand what it's like and how to bring more people of color into this movement, it starts by stop offending us.
stop saying that it's easy to be vegan because it is not easy for everybody to be vegan. You can do as many cheap foods, cheap videos, it doesn't matter, it doesn't change the situation for many of us. Stop supporting Sheriff Joe Arpaio. He is a known racist. Doesn't matter how many vegetarian things he says or does, he is a racist. He wants to put all of my people off of our land, quite frankly. Stop using hashtag all lives matter. Stop saying our diet is cruelty free when it's not. The other thing that many people in the animal rights movement thinks intersectionality is, is talking about slaughterhouse workers. Because somehow then you're talking about the impact of people. That's not what it's about. That is not what any of this is supposed to be about. For Food Empowerment Project, which I should say we have a Washington chapter. Sorry, I meant to mention that in the beginning. Um, it's about connections. Because no many people use the word intersectionality incorrectly, unfortunately. It's about drawing connections and showing how all of these issues are connected. All these forms of oppression, all these forms of exploitation are similar. Many people now in the vegan animal rights movement who are starting to say and starting to wake up about these terms are people who shut me down when I try to talk about these issues before. And it's very hard for me when Breeze talks about things like racial tension headaches, I'm going through that. I'm going through all of this. I didn't know what it was called because it's so much of what I've been dealing with for so long in the animal rights movement. Being shut down, being told, I don't have a place here. And how have I been told that? By constantly being criticized when I talk about the issues that I'm gonna talk about today. And it's because we need to listen. And I thank Breeze always for letting me understand that it's my skin color that is part of the reason why people feel comfortable treating me the way that they do in this movement. Because they have not known what to do with me since 1987. So when I talk about, you know, again, I should assume that everybody knows it's day two of the conference. I am going to assume that people understand what um, intersectionality means. But for me and for Food Empowerment Project, we do call it the connection of the issues because some people just don't understand it. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get my notes again. See, this is why I, I need more than 15 lightning minutes. Um, but these issues are entwined from the way animals are oppressed to the way human animals are oppressed. And our food is laced with these problems. When I talk about this issue, I'm not asking people to give up their fights for non-human animals. By no doubt, non-human animals need our fight and our passion. What I'm asking for is some consistency in the things that we do and the things that we say. So Food Empowerment Project is a vegan-based organization. One of the main things that we talk about is veganism and the impact on non-human animals. And I'm not going to go into the reasons why, because you all know. But it's hard for us to sit and talk about promoting veganism when we know that what we're encouraging people to do is eat more fruits and vegetables. What happens is we don't acknowledge those people and the suffering those people endure when they are picking our fruits and vegetables. The vast majority of people who are picking this food are Latinos from all walks of um, Latin and Central America. Approximately 3 million people are picking our produce. Approximately 400,000 of these are children. The average lifespan of a farm worker in the United States is 49 years old. That is due because to the long hours they work, the extreme conditions they work in, the hard working environment that they have to put up with, and the women endure constant sexual harassment and sexual abuse. Many of them are victims of wage theft. Maybe many of you don't know this, many farm workers are actually homeless. They live along the rivers and the creeks. Many live in substandard housing. Those in the state of California who live in what are called labor camps are forced to move out of the labor camps when picking season is over, which means that their children cannot finish their education, that they're constantly disrupted. And worse is that many of these farm workers are unable to pick the fruits and vegetables that they themselves are picking for other people to eat. 
Food Empowerment Project supports corporate campaigns, including the boycott of Wendy's. Now, you've probably heard, thanks to the vegan movement, about Wendy's having a veggie burger. I'm asking people that if you truly get the connection of these issues and you truly believe in intersectionality, do not promote Wendy's and their veggie burger until they sign the agreement with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. All they are asking... All they're asking to be paid is one penny more per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. One penny more. Why are they asking for one penny? Because they've already been found that the corporations that are paying one penny more is making an impact on their lives. One penny is making an impact on people's lives. So we support these corporate campaigns. We also do a school supply drive for the children of farm workers because we want to make sure that we give back. I don't see doing a school supply drive for the children of farm workers as an act of charity. I see it as a right, trying to right an injustice that's taking place right now, that's happening to people right now. Unless you pick and grow your own food, you have farm workers to thank for almost every bite that you take. And we owe them something. They sacrifice so much. Do you know that women crossing the border to get in the United States get on birth control pills before they cross the border because rape is so prevalent. They sacrifice so much that for their children to have a good education that we can give something back and help ensure that those children have the education that their families are sacrificing so much for. One of the other things when we talk about food justice issues is not just what happens here but also what happens abroad. When we in the animal rights movement have candy bars and talk about chocolate that's cruelty-free because it's vegan, it's not taking into consideration child labor and slavery that's taking place right now as I stand here in Western Africa. 70% of the world's cocoa comes from Western Africa, where 1.8 million children in Ghana and the Ivory Coast alone are the victims of the worst forms of child labor, which include slavery. When I first learned about this in 2000, it was because of a documentary where they interviewed a slave who had escaped and was asked by a reporter, what would you say to Westerners who still eat chocolate? And the former slave said, when they're eating chocolate, they're eating my flesh. And as a vegan, since I was in high school, in Texas, no less, I understood what this must mean. I understood that I had to change the way I looked at chocolate, just in the same way that I changed how I looked at eggs and chicken and fish. And I could no longer see chocolate as a luxury, but more of a responsibility, a responsibility of how I wield this and what I choose to eat. So how do these kids get there? The kids um, in Western Africa, some of them are sold into it because they're very, very poor families, sell them into the chocolate industry. Um, believing um, that they're going to be schooled. Some of them are stolen from marketplaces. Some of them are, their families believe they're actually going to earn wages and be able to send that money back. But instead, they never see their children again. They carry heavy cacao bags. If they're too heavy, they get beaten. They use machetes, which are technically illegal. For any child to be using, children as young as five and seven years old have been seen, documented using machetes. That's why a lot of the children have scars on their arms and their legs. There are current lawsuits going on right now because of what's happening to these children in Western Africa, where former slaves have talked about having their feet cut open when they're first um, part of the process to try and break these children so that they won't run away. These children and adults are locked in at night. And if they try to run away, they are sometimes never heard from again. We are talking about slavery happening right now, as I stand here in Western Africa for chocolate. So Food Empowerment Projects has created a list of chocolate we do and do not recommend based on where the cacao is sourced from. Um, you can, it's a free app as well. Um, but this is when I really, you know, 
when we want to be informed, when, when we're a movement that talks about being informed about food choices and we want to school everybody about everything, we can't sit there and talk about our chocolate being cruelty free because people know better. They've heard about this. People, you know, we always talk about like, why don't people in other social justice movements, you know, adapt our cause? Well, what about because we say things like this? What about the fact that these farm workers and advocates working for farm worker issues or people working on human rights issues that acknowledge the trafficking, the slavery that's going on in Western Africa, hearing us talk about um, cruelty-free chocolate. But when we talk about food justice issues, sometimes we don't need to look further than our own neighborhoods. Because what's happening in the racism that's happening in this food industry is happening in most communities. And that's the lack of access to healthy foods um, you want to talk about hunger. Hunger is a very huge issue in the United States, but it's always so much easier for us to talk about somewhere else, instead to look at what's happening in our own backyard and why it's happening here is because of racism and exploitation of people of color in the United States. That's why it's happening here. Why is the majority of communities in the United States that, don't lack, that lack access to healthy foods are people of color? So when we talk about veganism being easy, I really invite anybody to come with me or Brenda and take a look at the food in some of these communities and say that. Unfortunately, eating healthy in the United States is a privilege. It's not a right like it should be. In Vallejo, which is in between um, San Francisco and Sacramento, which is where we're doing our work right now, we were asked to do this work by David Hilliard, one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party. We've been asked to do this work there because we knew, they knew that there was a problem there. So what we do is we go in only when invited by communities to go into these communities, and we do assessments on what the access to healthy food is like. In this one area, which is about 45 minutes from um, Berkeley, ha in half in all the low-income low areas, in half of all the stores with any produce, 70% of this produce was available in cans. Nothing fresh. 93% of all the liquor stores in the city are in low-income areas. There is a liquor store for every 3,231 residents in low-income areas, compared to 31,000 for every resident in high-income areas. I often hear vegans say things like, beans and rice, I, I, you know, I'd eat beans and rice every day. You know, I, I'm somebody who my family, I went vegetarian, I, well, I went vegetarian when I was five. Due to family circumstances, my family did not have a lot of money. I had to eat whatever people brought us which often meant I couldn't stick with being vegetarian because we didn't have the money or the capacity for me to be able to do that. But you know what? I had the privilege that my mom had a car. She may have been raising my sisters and I on her own, but we had a car, which is very, compared to the people in the communities that we're looking at, is very privileged. But I went vegan in high school. And I did. I made a decision that I was going to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every day. You can read a blog that I wrote about being a vegan and having to work in a fast food restaurant because it was the only job in walking distance from where I lived. There is a reality that we need to face as a movement that not everybody has that ability. Now, I, will, I, will, I cannot stress this enough. I'm not saying that vegan activists should be going into these communities. In fact, that's the last thing we should be doing. People of color have their own leaders in these communities. We don't need vegans. We don't need white people going into these communities. What we need is support. Food Empowerment Project, again, we go in when we're asked to. We make these assessments, and we put out reports. What are the reports for? They are for the community groups to raise money for their work. So people always, you know, whenever I give these talks, well, what can we do? What can we do? I get emails constantly about, oh, I'm a vegan and I want to open a store in one of these communities. Oh, I want to start a farmer's market there. I want to, you know what? People are working on these things there. If you have financial privilege, donate to those community groups that are working on these issues. 
because what they're working on is trying to get more healthy produce in the communities. They have plenty of junk food, they have plenty of meat, they have plenty of milk. What they don't have, what they're wanting, what they're demanding, and what they're asking for is fresh fruits and vegetables. Support their work. Support their gardens. You know, it might be uncomfortable. A lot of the groups doing this work are churches. You know what? If you care about these issues and you want everybody to have access to healthy food, you support the people on the ground doing the work. You don't tell them what you think you should, they should be doing. You don't tell them anything. You ask them what they need. But more than not, they're going to need your money. And you need to give it to them. Isn't that, a, God, that was obnoxious. But I think you get my point. <laughs> And I'm not even talking about Food Empowerment Project. I'm talking about these communities. I'm talking about the Vallejos People's Garden that we work with. I'm talking about Global Center for Success. I'm talking about those organizations who are doing the on-the-ground work that need the money. One of the things everybody can do in this room, though, as a vegan, as an activist, although I'm not on Facebook, I'm sure a lot of you are, support living wage campaigns. Because one of the biggest barriers that we found in our work, number one biggest barrier for accessing healthy foods in our serving, was not being able to afford it. So what can we do? There's a lot of efforts. There's um, Rock restaurants. They're, they're organizing restaurant uh, workers to demand for living wages. There's the Fight for 15, which is fast food workers. There's living wage campaigns going on across the cities, states, counties. Support those living wage campaigns. The more you demand for people to be paid what they're worth and their value, well, they'll never be paid as much as they should be. This helps them be able to maybe quit one of the three jobs they're working. Okay? I worked three jobs in college, and I went to school full time, and I ran an animal rights group. My mom worked two jobs sometimes to help make ends meet, almost always at fast food. These workers need to make better wages. They can provide for their families, and they can afford the produce that they should have every right to accessing. So when you're trying to figure out what is it that you can do, start promoting these. We put it, you know, you can follow us on social media. We post the ones that we believe are the real deal. But you can hashtag, you know, it's not a matter of, you know, when, when I wrote a blog about why we sh all vegans should support living wages, I read on other people's pages about how, how does this woman not know that we're already doing this? Well, you know what? Because I don't see many vegans promoting living wage campaigns, as we should be. So that's why this woman says those kinds of things. Because I'm hearing people say it, oh yeah, I do internally. Well, how often do you tell people about going vegan? It should be the same difference, right, when we're talking about access to healthy foods. So, again, I'm not asking for people to give up their great work for non-human animals. It needs to happen. Again, I've been doing it since I was 17, absolutely. But what I'm saying is, let's have some consistency. Let's not, you know, support people who are known racist. Let's, let's not use hashtags like all lives matter. Let's not, you know, um, promote Wendy's. When there's an active campaign right now by our natural allies, the farm workers, asking for people to boycott Wendy's. <coughs> if they have a veggie burger, great. You don't need to promote it because you know what? Ben and Jerry's and Wendy's have million dollar advertising budgets that they don't need vegans doing the work for them. So, by the way, Ben and Jerry's has not responded to us about where their chocolate comes from. Yeah. Let's note that as well for all the vegans that are trying their ice cream. Um, oh my God, I'm nasty. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Can you tell? It's like 19, like 20 something years of pent up aggression coming out. Um, but I appreciate that some of you get this, and I, you being here is what helps me feel comfortable talking about it. But I was talking about what you shouldn't do. What you should do is, you know, support organizations run by people of color. If you are a vegan, support our organizations because we need your support. We don't all have cute animals to show all the time because we're fighting it all. And I ask you to support some of the women in this room, including myself. Um, but again, these issues are connected. And what I'm hoping for, you know, and this is what happened to me. 
You know, I used to work for an environmental justice group working on um, labor issues in the tech sector. So Apple, Samsung, solar panels, how they're basically killing communities of color around the globe. When I first learned about veganism when I was 17, there was this intense, I don't know how to describe it, but you all know it, this thing in your belly that happens where you're like, oh my God, this has to stop and I have to do everything in my power to stop it. I hope that you'll feel that way on some of these food justice issues true. Not because it furthers veganism, but because it furthers you as a compassionate individual. And one of the reasons I feel comfortable doing the work that Food Empowerment Project does, although I get less speaking requests, is because I believe that we tend to be people who get it, right? We get the injustices that are happening to non-human animals. You know, we always want people to, you know, widen their circle of compassion. I ask vegans to do that. Widen your circle of compassion to include human animals in that and understand the oppression and what it is that they're going through. And it'll help truly build an equitable society once we do that because we're, all these issues are connected. I have something called a workshop later um, where <laughs> I'm not quite sure, so Patrice is gonna help me with a workshop. So I, it'll be more of a discussion, I believe, and we can all make sure I'm less angry. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, damn Lauren. <laughs> Are these your glasses here, or? Okay, no, 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 it's cool. So like, we're gonna break for lunch. There will not be any chocolate involved. Um, <laughs> at least not, not, not that slavery chocolate. No, I mean, Lauren actually brought up a couple of really great points. Um, like, the <laughs> one or two out out of like, you know, this, this morning, uh, just like, but just like listening, listening to you, like I was really convicted about like a lot of things and really being present to so many emotions uh, um, up to it, including like the way that I use my own language around, Lauren, where'd you go? This, oh, there you are, okay. <laughs> um, around the way that like I, I, I can and conduct myself and I, you know what, I talk about like, just, just to haul myself out here for a minute, I talk about chocolate in the same way that I, I listen to people talk about my steak. Um, you know, like, well, I went vegan, I've, I've, I've done enough. It's, it's done and dusted and like, you know, and I need my chocolate. Um, just the, the, the way that we, we, we frame these conversations is important. And, you know, and even like, you know, it, as vegans, we do this all the time. Like I, even listening to Marnie's like really passionate um, conversation around like, you know, her relationship with animals and hearing her say my horse and like, you know, and just this just really changing um, how we talk about these things and what you said about specifically out of like all of the things that you said, but like specifically about like, you know, changing our, our dialogue from like a luxury to a responsibility. And I'm like, oh my God, I need this conference so much. Um, <laughs> And like, you know, and recognizing how poor an ally I am sometimes. And, you know, and I, 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 I plug Food Empowerment Project and a well-fed world. I don't know like where Dawn has gotten off. To. There you are. Um, like every time I have an interview, every time I appear someplace, which is much more frequently now, inexplicably to me. But like, you know, I, I absolutely plug these organizations. And the reason why I'm going to start sounding like a broken record is because like, you know what, PETA? is the face of fucking animal rights. I am so angry about that. I get, I get so angry about the fact that like these organizations are not getting the attention they deserve for doing this truly phenomenal intersectional work that actually expands the dialogue about human and non-human animal relationships so much wider and so much more revolutionarily, if that I can say that, like, you know, then, 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 then 
taking your clothes off in Times Square and like, you know, and, and standing there and, and like, you know, and, and putting, Jesus, t putting on KKK hoods and, you know, and, and having these extraordinarily abusive campaigns. You are the voices, you are the faces that we actually need being, you know, being front and center. And whatever I can do as an ally to like, you know, to, to change that paradigm and, you know, and whenever, whenever I hear people say, oh, animal rights community, look at what PETA does. You know, I'm like, no, don't look at what PETA does. That's exactly what the fucking problem is. Look at what Don and Lauren are doing because their work is actually what should be reflecting what our movement should look like. And we're not doing that. And because you're talking about PETA, because you're giving them all of this attention, you're actually part of the problem. Highlight the people that are doing the important work. That's what we all should be doing in this room. So whenever we, when we walk out of here, we'll leave this conference this weekend, do that as much as you can.